Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord, another day that you give us. Lord, we ask that you touch the hearts and minds and the, and the spirits of, of those that are hearing this message and give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Heavenly Father, as we continue in our journey navigating the seasons and just appreciating the love that you share with us so freely through your word and through your Holy Spirit, we ask that uh, your name be glorified in this message and that those that have ears and eyes are able to hear spiritually what you are saying during this season. We give you all the praise and thanks and the glory in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, so the power has just uh, gone on to load shedding. So, uh, yeah, for the law of the spirit of life is made in Christ and Jesus and made free for us. And this is uh, free from the law of sin and death. Uh, this is quite a complex uh, discussion, a complex message. Because as we move from one place to another, one position to a further position in Christ Jesus, it allows us opportunity to know that we are on this journey, this journey that happens in our lives right from the time of conception, before before we were knitted in the mother's womb, he knew he knew us and he had a plan for us. And he brings it to completion until that last breath is taken, until we go back home to be with the Lord. I'm picking up here from Romans chapter 8 verses 1, which I opened up with, but let's have a look at uh, verses 2 from chapter 8. For the law of the Spirit is of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Word wealth made free, which is a strong accordance, 1659, is to liberate, to acquit, to, to free and to deliver. In the New Testament, the word is used exclusively for, the, for Jesus setting uh, believers at liberty from the dominion of sin. Now this body of death that we carry around and have carried around in our past, which has now come into the marvelous, marvelous light of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's, it's, it's that uh, body that's chained to a corpse because that old man is dead or the old woman is dead and it's now just attached to, to, uh, to our bodies and, and it's just a corpse that's needing to be let go of. But sometimes it can't be freed. Sometimes we, we despair and deliver it, saying, well, I just want this corpse to be gone and but remember that despair gives way to the declaration of the victory. It allows us to walk victoriously in Christ Jesus. And it's not because the, uh, the struggle ceases, but it's an opportunity that the human strength is exceeded by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Paul begins his teaching and description of the life in the Spirit as he first declares that the Spirit assures us of the death to sin and makes holiness possible. Holiness is something that we attain to, something that we strive towards, and something that we pursue. Pursue. Just remember that word. But remember that uh, fact of salvation by faith alone is what counts. And there's no works that can be done to be able to justify our position in Christ that allows us to know that we are, have an eternal inheritance that's secured. But it's that sealing. Remember the sealing that brings the authority that allows us to be able to walk in His power and for believers to be free of the, the, the banishing judgment of God's wrath that he wants to uh, withhold from, from this world. But at times there's, there's things that are laid out and made, made known that needs to be worked through. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son into this world so that whoever may believe in him may have eternal life. The law of the Spirit in Christ does not refer to God's written moral law in the Old Testament, which we're going to go into in quite detail over the next little season. That allows us to appreciate that, you know, when you have the written law, which is made out of tablets and can be broken as Moses did when he came down from Mount Sinai after seeing them worshipping the idols and smashed the tablets and went up and got the second bear. Now, you know, the New Testament covenantal believers, when you cross over and you come into the new, new relationship, because it's all about the covenantal relationship, which again, we're also going to go into and explore this much, much deeper so that we can appreciate the love of the Father that He has for us. But it's the system and the operation of the Spirit in the life of every single new believer. When they give their lives to the Lord, they get, they get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then starts their journey of learning the different principles and the different uh, dynamics and and how, how he operates in the Spirit and how we can actually be attuned to what he's saying and doing in the season for us. 
The Holy Spirit is a gift. It's a gift that cannot be earned, and it's uh, it's it's carried out in our lives from the from the moment we say yes. And that that uh, the breaking of the dominion of the old law of sin and death reveals to us a higher truth and a higher law, which is love, because God is love. They are given by law, uh, reward, sorry, they are given by God. The law, which is that written code in the Old Testament, as we know, the tablets, but so many more rules and regulations that came with it that no one could keep, was powerless to enable people to meet its demands because of the fact that it depended on a sinful human nature to carry them out. Now, what is a human being? If we ask ourselves, what is a human being? Just write that down and let's continue with the message and ask the Lord to reveal that to you. But let's turn our attention to, to the one who came as a human and was faultless and uh, the human nature of, of, of Jesus that was real, that was tangible. Because he came and he worked on, walked on this earth. Now, I've had a lot of people ask me, Where's the, where's the tangible stuff that you're talking about? And all you have to do is just point back to the cross. That's the most tangible thing you can ever experience in your whole life. Apart from the word of God. That's the next tangible thing. But the human nature of Jesus was real, but obviously sinless. Now in Philippians, let's just go to Philippians. I just want to go to Philippians chapter 2. If you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, we may be able to read this together. Uh... To start for Ephesians, Philippians chapter three, uh, 2 verses 5 through to 11 tells us of some great things. Even when we were dead in trespass, he made us alive together with Christ. By the grace we have been saved and have been raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, but it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then it goes on to talk about being brought near by the blood. But there's something very important for us to appreciate and take hold of because it's... Sorry, I've just read you Ephesians. My apologies, I haven't gone to Philippians. Well, that's also quite a good message there because actually that's... <laughs> this was last week I was just wishing that um, uh, Ephesians would be shared more often because it, it tells us our position in Christ. And uh, not only has it been shared yesterday at our, at our service, which was really encouraging, but I've just... <laughs> Maybe by God's will, I read uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11 instead of Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11 goes to show that we're not, we're not all perfect. But it's speaking of the humbled and exalted Christ. Let this mind be in you, in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Now this human nature of Jesus tells us something beautiful. And it's a great kingdom dynamic that we can appreciate and follow its humility. Human perspectives on humility distort the idea of often humbling people by loveless actions that rob them of dignity and nobility. But Christ-like humility is manifested in the freedom of God's Son, to affirm the fullness of all God, of all God has placed in him, without needing to flaunt, prove, or push it through self-advancement. Jesus' complete absence of any need to clutch for power or attention is manifested in humility. It's the royal spirit that the King of Heaven himself displayed in servant-like graciousness, just as Christ's humility received ultimate exaltation. So I call to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Points to the way for the rise of God's highest purpose in each of us, each and every single one of us. Humbling ourselves opens us up to increased graces. Childlikeness is, is the doorway to this uh, dynamic kingdom, which is your kingdom come. 
in our life and our service to him. As we continue going through our journey, we, as I've always said before, we take steps and we say, Lord, I'm take, stepping out in faith for you here. And then there's other times where we've gone, okay, we've now looked at a situation and how do we improve it? How do we strengthen it? How, and where do we go? Where's our first point of call? It should be prayer, worship, and Bible study. Being able to allow us that opportunity to understand a little bit more about this Christ-likeness humility that he so well displayed for us to follow. But in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 through to 18, it speaks of bringing many sons to glory. And I'll just pick up on one of the verses. So I'll encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 2 verses 10 through to 18. I want to pick up on verse 17. I've, I've made a note to, to just go through. Uh, I'll go from 16. For, he, uh, for indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Seeds are very important. So we're going to come to that in future teachings. But let's continue. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make proper... Propitation for the sin, for the sins of the people. So he took everything on his shoulders to become the sinless man. Took on the sin of the world, so that they may be saved. But they didn't realize it at the time. But there's another beautiful kingdom dynamic that I would like to read with you. Is that it's a uh, how Jesus sings praises with us, and this is all very important for us because we can have the prayer. But there's a sacrificial service of, of, of praise and worship that is so important for us to be able to come into his presence. So we've got the prayer on the one hand that we can pray daily. But then we've also got the, that, that wonderful gift and the spiritual uh, opportunity to worship him in spirit and truth. And that's under praise and worship. It speaks of how the Messianic prophecy in Psalms 22 verses 22 reveals how the Spirit of the Christ fills the New Testament church as Jesus identi identifies himself so closely with these people and enters into songs of worship with them. But note a couple of things. How the Lord himself enters into the gathering, i.e. into the midst. And two, how the joint praises releases the spirit of prophecy. I will declare your name to my brethren. And as the holy power of praise ignites the testimony of Jesus, great things are possible. Now appreciating the emphasis of uh, the genuine humility of Jesus here, the path that he trod as a suffering redeemer was fitting, thereby making him perfect. It doesn't mean that Jesus had moral shortcomings. It just meant that by becoming perfect or complete as an all-sufficient saviour, now I'm reading out of scripture here we're trying to keep it as pure as possible without bringing too much of the world into it but we do live in the world and that's something that we're called to do is we we're not of the world but we live in the world and that that brings us the opportunity to share this good news with others because he has gone ahead of us to open the doors and open up the way of salvation not only to us but to loved ones as well now, there's a profound unity that cannot be uttered or understood or explained when there's a close relationship between Jesus as well as uh, those he saves. We are called his brethren because the physical birth of Jesus shares our descent from Adam all the way back, right, right from the start, and the redemptive plan that God had for both of them. But in the new birth, the believers become numbers in the family of God. The family of God is growing. It's, it's growing from strength to strength. What about those outside of, of, his, of his eternal plan? There's lots of times that we may have kind of veered off one way or belief or held a conviction of something other or outside of Christ Jesus, but he works all things for the good for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. But the ultimate purpose of Christ's incarnation was the destruction of the devil and the deliverance of both fear and death. The power of Satan, although not annihilated, was curbed. Curbed in the lives of those committed to Christ. And it's something that we continue to work on in and through our own selves as well as each other is just really appreciating the love of Christ 
that he has for each and every one of us, but also knowing that when there's the devil who's trying to um, have an influence in their lives, we, we, we gently and we lovingly just try and bring it back into um, the perfect love. The perfect love which will be perfected when we go home to be with the Lord. But also notice that Jesus took himself on as part of uh, human nature. Not as an angel, but actually as a, as a human nature. Now, I just want to refresh on something that we read last week, which allows, allows us to be able to um, uh, take heart to, to what I'm talking about here. From the scriptures, it just allows us to be able to understand our condition. Last week I spoke of the word discovers our condition and how this is so important for us to appreciate the power of that two-edged sword. Just repeat, and just, just a reminder, the word of God is living and powerful, is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the, to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the hearts. I've just had a recent conversation with someone saying that, you know, some things may, may reveal the heart. Whether that's a good thing or perhaps maybe not such a good thing, at least it's a revelation of the heart, which then can actually be a sounding board to, to ch allow us to check ourselves. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who we must give an account. Now the word wealth powerful that I just want to go through is Strong's Accordance 1756, which is comparable in meaning to the word energetic, which stems from this word, and it's used elsewhere only in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 9 and Philemon number 6, which denotes something at work, active as well as effective. It's the opposite of idleness or inactive or ineffective. Now that's something that perhaps maybe that word that's spoken, remember that tongue, how, how um, it can be the rudder that steers the ship. And how we need to guard our hearts and our tongue. But at the same time with those that you love, if something's shared, it can be appreciated that this is just the heart of the matter that needs to be resolved. And where the heart of the matter may come in is the healing opportunity that's available for us all if we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. Remember I started the message off saying there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Now... When we look at these uh, revelations of what's written in the Word and how it reveals our condition, you know, taking the log out of our own eye before taking the speck out of our brother's or sister's eye, it just gives us the opportunity to appreciate that the foremost understanding of faith's call to confess the Word of God is, is, is the understanding of the Rhema and the Logos. The lesson relates to Israel's renunciation of God's promise, which resulted in a whole generation dying in the wilderness and failing to possess the inheritance God intended for them. In this context, the Bible described itself, the word of God is living and powerful. The term for word here is Greek word logos, which commonly indicates the expression of a complete idea and is used in referring to the Holy Scriptures. In contrast with Rhema, it generally refers to a word spoken or given. This recommends our understanding and the difference between all the Bible and the single promise or promises of the Holy Spirit by bringing to our mind from the Word of God. When facing a situation of need, trial, difficulty, the promises of God may become a raiment to you. That is a weapon in the Spirit, and which is the Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 6 verses 17 goes into this talking about how we can put on the armor of God and the helmets of salvation. Its authority is that this word becomes comes from the Bible and God's word, the complete Logos. Its immediate significance is that He has spoken it to your soul by His Spirit. And He's calling forth faith, just as He did from Israel when He pointed them towards their inheritance. Faith's confession receives God's word, which is the rhema, and stands firm upon these promises. However, faith's confession is strong, not in human willpower, but in the divine will revealed in the whole of the scriptures, which is the Holy Bible, the Logos, the complete word of God, from which the rhema, which is the present word of promise, has been received. Notice how those that love Christ want to point people to him, because that's where their inheritance, their inheritance lies. Remember the vertical and horizontal. 
it's very important for us to appreciate the, the, the gems, the nuggets, the gold that comes from these scriptures. Because it's speaking of that compassionate high priest which allows us to appreciate even further from that passage of scripture how there's a special encouragement to loyalty. Loyalty is that human sympathy of our great high priest, giving us the opportunity to worship him in spirit and truth. Now in this verses 15 and 16, let's just have a look at that. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help time in need. When we come boldly, this literally means without reservation, without um, without anything, with just coming as, as we are. Just with frankness, with our open speech, which, you know, sometimes we can have that between ourselves, which then helps us navigate and help each other. But we appreciate that there's a throne of grace that's not of judgment, but obtaining mercy for the past and, and present uh, grace for now and the future. When we go into the Word, it, as I said, not only discovers our condition, but gives us an opportunity to appreciate His love for us and care for us. Now, we have masters. We have masters here on the earth, and we have our, our ultimate master in heaven. In one chapter, uh, Peter, one Peter, one Peter, chapter two, verses twenty-three and twenty-five. It speaks of um, a number of things: being submissive to the master. Verses eighteen, it talks about how servants and masters are are working co codependently. But a little further on, and take it from. Chapter 2, verses 22, speaking of Christ who suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. An example is to uh, go under, which is to write, hence an underwriting. The word referred to tracing letters, copying the written, the writings of the, of the teacher. And it came to denote that the example could be followed. The example of Christ enables us to endure when we suffer for our faith. Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteous by those stripes we have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So, so important that to appreciate the truths of what the Lord is saying to us during the season, is that we've gone astray, and like he did with the 99, and he went after the one and brought the one back into the fold, but he led them. He didn't force them, he didn't coerce them, he didn't threaten them, because the sheep hear his voice. So in verses 21, Christ is our example, and here being our Redeemer. And his victorious death makes it possible for our response of death to sin, which is repentance, and life for God, which is righteousness. This is New Testament believers in Christ's conversion and its broadest application that allows us to appreciate that when Peter describes, when he says, by those stripes we are healed, he was also making reference to quoting Isaiah chapter 53 verses 5 and that's to show the personal wholeness mentally, physically, psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, financially but this all flows from this conversion that is given to us so turning our attention back to Romans we can appreciate some of the things that have been said in this wonderful book that gives us the opportunity to know the way to know the truth and to know the life. Romans chapter 8 verses 3 to 11 is quite a lengthy passage of scripture so 
I'll let you read it because it's speaking of freeing from indwelling sin. But Paul presents two ways of life and they are central to the whole discussion of our eternal salvation. To walk according to the flesh is to follow sinful desires of one's old life. Perhaps maybe uh, it was drinking, perhaps it was a lavish lifestyle, or perhaps maybe it was um, not keeping him center of it all. To walk according to the Spirit is to follow the desires of the, the Holy Spirit and to live in ways that will please Him. And Christians accordingly will live according to the Spirit, and this involves the holiness, not in actions and words, but also in the thoughts of our minds each moment of the day. Those thoughts and words and deeds are very, very important. And when we, when we have that uh, thought of, of uh, as we're going to learn a little later, about the conversion of the, the, the Ten Commandments from stone into our hearts, because Jesus spoke about, for example, murder. Do not murder. But he also said in the New Testament, he said, murder begins in the heart. So when we renew our minds in Christ Jesus, that's where the transformational process may, may begin to happen. When we invite him in, we give, we give him space in our lives. And we also look at what he's saying and doing in the word and all the accounts that he, that he, that he did for us so, so many years ago. People in the flesh, and there's people in the, f the spirit, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing journey. Because, as I said earlier, we are not of this world, but we live in this world. And when we want to make a difference for His name's sake and to glorify His name, we come across things that have perhaps maybe shown otherwise. It, it shows a very dark side of of um, of living. But God's plan is restoration from the beginning. So when we when we overcome these challenges and obstacles, which seems to be so many days, the times these days is that uh, there's more and more that seems to be presented as um, as that negative report. What happens if you take the blood of the cross that and the, and the truth of the, the the gospel and allow not for the enemy to prevail, but for God's kingdom to advance through the restoration process? that allows for His name to be glorified and His name to be known. I'll share one example, not going into detail, but there's been some things that I've worked through over the number of years that I've been pressing into Him and learning more about Him and asking, seeking and knocking. And as I go forward, I find more of perhaps maybe some of the, 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 the historical um, situations that have prevented good things from happening or maybe uh, allowed the negative things to um, take place in our lives. And does that mean that the, the tools and the uh, resources available will give the same result? Or do we, do we overcome that challenge that could actually be a byproduct of the sin that was in this world and work co-laboring, partnering with the Lord to be able to overcome what the enemy meant for evil? The Old Testament laws and principles versus the New Testament laws and dynamics is, is something that gives us the opportunity to allow the transformational process and uh, journey uh, to happen, as I said earlier, from one place to another or from one state of being to another. We understand that we are all human and, and we, we, we're not perfect like he was perfect. But it gives us the opportunity to grow in that, uh, that area. Paul spoke about the, the believer in Christ and the life that he, but he also warned that sometimes they may walk according to the flesh at time to time because this is the journey of going forward and then realizing, okay, is, is this the discernment that I've got that I'm walking in the spirit or is it, is it perhaps maybe walking too much in the flesh? As I mentioned um, in my last message or the, the message before, you know, I've had to take that, that, um, that reading of, of, of that two-edged sword and, and look at that. How am, I, how am I stewarding spiritual things, even though I'm making a, a, an effort in the physical side of things, hoping to present a, 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 a solution, but he's got the perfect solution. Come to me, all who are, who are he heavy laden or burdened, I'll give you rest. Paul was also speaking about the two directions that were available. Um, and to show the ultimate consequences of these uh, choices or ways that we go. But if by our spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, that's the process and the, um, the workings of the Holy Spirit through sanctification, growing in holiness. 
But it's the act of knowing God and His holiness that puts to death the things that we were once so accustomed to. As well as the heart and the mind. Very, very, very important this because I want to just pause here for a second. Renew your, heart, renew, renew your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Take that heart of stone out and complete it and fill it with the heart of flesh. And the heart of flesh is not necessarily saying we're walking by the flesh, but it's the heart of flesh that's saying, I'm going to soften your heart. I'm going to work a deep work inside of you because you're, you, you've now released something or there's something that I've made uh, known to you uh, through the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can work right outside the, 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 the words of the, of, of the Scriptures. But it's the Scriptures that lead us into all truth. But it's the worship that ha helps that healing heart. Remember Hannah, when Hannah was barren, she just praised the Lord in those circumstances, in the barrenness. And then the Lord allowed that opportunity to bless her beyond measure. So when we're standing in faith and standing in things that we haven't yet seen come to pass, that exercises that Hebrews 11 verses 1, which is we walk by faith and not by sight. When we put forth the effort... We put, the, we put forth the effort by the Holy Spirit and the effort is getting into his word and praying and going alongside other believers or non-believers and bringing them into the kingdom of God and helping them, showing them and guiding them into his word and into their inheritance. I just want to go to John chapter 5 because this allows us to appreciate, hopefully, if the heart's not hardened, it's if there's... If there's uh, if it's softened to, to the message, we can appreciate that there's, a, there's an opportunity for healing to come through all things that have happened in the past. And when we appreciate that he is the true vine, we have that opportunity to, yeah, to know that we are, we are journeying towards that love to be perfected. Let's speak of a fullness of joy which comes with love. The kingdom dynamic which is Christ-likeness. Jesus points the way to joy, a divine quality of ca and character that is possible and possessed and given only by God. It is rooted in with a relationship with the Holy Spirit, not in earthly or material things. Christ-like joy is seen in the description of His for who? For the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And joy is derived from the confidence that the price of dying to our will holds the inevitable certainty and eventual realization, the triumph of His. So He will triumph over everything, including sin and death, including a hardened heart. For Jesus brings sons and daughters into fellowship with the Father was His delight. Through the cross was the means to that eventual joy. This very trait was prophesied of Messiah, of the Messiah, and he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Thus the Savior's food, that is the, his fulfillment, was to do the will of God and accomplish his work. So when we appreciate, number one, that we have an opportunity to repent. Number two, we have an opportunity to become holy, righteous in him. No one's perfectly holy. We are working towards holiness. The true vine is our shepherd. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. That servant, master, son, father terminology describes the believer's relationship to Christ and to the Father quite vividly. It's that intimacy, it's that relationship that no one can break. None is quite profound as when Jesus called his disciples his friends because it spoke of that mutual love the mutual love that was available for all. what happens if we encounter a situation where we are unable to present the gospel to someone that we love or uh, not willing to hear the word of God and the truth and the life that it brings we understand that sometimes it's that transformation process that needs to happen from one state of being to another from one position to another from A to B there's a godless, secular society which is hostile towards Christ and his followers. Simply because the believers in Christ 
big difference between believers in Christ and Christians based on their intimacy with the Lord. It's in opposition to the world system. And this is where the clash of the kingdoms happen. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and dark places of this world. But when we when we seated with Christ in heavenly, heavenly realms, we are not operating from that principalities, spiritual realm. We're operating from a place of love. Now sometimes those principalities would want to threat or uh, coerce or, or, or bring something to to discredit his authority and his lordship over our lives. But ultimately we know who wins in the end. So there's no contest. But what there is an opportunity for is to be able to come into the fullness of his revelation as brothers and sisters, physically, biologically and spiritually. Function being Christ oriented, him being the center of it all, and the Holy Spirit gives us the opportunity for him to work in and through our lives. And the witness is authentic because God's Spirit is the Spirit of truth. So, how do you let the Holy Spirit lead you? Let's just have a look at a couple of points that I'd like to share with you. So when we, when we start looking for the Holy Spirit and inviting him into our presence, into our lives, it gives us the opportunity to A, have that great Im intimacy opportunity. That should be exciting enough and adventurous enough to, to enter into. But how do we let the Holy Spirit lead us? We've got to seek the heavenly guidance from above, one day at a time. Find the time. If you've got time to brush your teeth, you've got time to find time with the Lord. Sincere desire and worthiness invite the Holy Spirit of revelation into our lives. Giving Him the opportunity, the space and the presence to be able to abide. Abide in me and I'll abide in you. Without me you can do nothing. But sincerely desire. Not just, well, it's a chore, it's a habit, it's a... <sighs> no. It's a yearning, it's a longing, it's an awe, it's a revelation. It's something that he's going to speak to you about, to help you, guide you, lead you. And when we have that sincerity of the heart, it breaks any mold. It breaks any hardness of heart that's, that's in our hearts at the moment or has been. But we've got to appropriately do this. How do we do this? Through our own time with the Lord. Ask your Father in heaven. He knows your needs before you even know them. Get equipped into a believing church. A believing church is a believing, uh, Christ-centered, oriented love for the love of God that pours out, never forsaking the gathering of the saints, worshiping in spirit and truth, fellowshipping, helping each other become more like Him and being faithful to God's commands. Now Moses was uh, presenting a couple of things about the Ten Commandments which we're going to touch on briefly uh, here but expand a little bit more over the next little while and gives us the opportunity to know that um, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that Jesus was revealed in the new way He was hidden in the old available for us all but they needed someone to guide them and you know the the truth of the matter is that it's available for us all yes we may need somebody to guide us and show us the inheritance that's available for us but ultimately it's us it's our it's our opportunity to to get to know him like with any relationship without communication there's no relationship now, is there an opportunity for that to just remain as it is or is there an opportunity for that to um, be overcome through more effective loving caring christ-centered Father, Son, and Holy Spirit communication. Think of things above, not on the earth. Colossians 3. Exodus chapter 20, verses uh, 1 to 17, goes into the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. And as I said, I'm going to be expanding on this so that we can keep this message in the time frame that, uh, that allows. But in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, I want to just really emphasize this so that it can become the foundation of um, how we proceed with the heart of the issue, the heart of the matter, and the truth. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, when the Pharisees were asking, uh, 
well, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, were asking, which is the first commandment of all, being the scribes, are asking this question. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Pharisees' code of morality consisted of countless rules and regulations that no one could keep. You break them one, you break them all. What's the consequences of breaking one of the written contractual commandments? Perhaps maybe it was stoning to death. Perhaps it was a, a, a life without God. But in the New Testament, the, the first and greatest one was, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Heart, soul, spirit, mind. And then when you do that, get that vertical relationship right, your horizontal relationships would be so much more strengthened. Now I don't say this to you, I say it to us. I say this to us because it's a work in progress. But Jesus summed up the, all the moral obligations in the world. Love. Everything came back down to love. Do we love? I watched something just recently about a tape that was given to a friend and he listened to the message. And, and the crux of the message was when we go home to meet with the Lord, he will ask that question. Did you know that I loved you? Did you believe that I loved you? Did you trust that I love you? And those are the fo most fundam fundamental truths that we need to establish in our own hearts before we can do anything else. Is do we believe, do we trust, and do we have faith that our Heavenly Father loves us as we are? Come as we are, just as we are. Do we believe and do we trust that He loves us? This is expressed in that twofold direction, both vertically and horizontally, between God and our neighbor, as found in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through to 40. I didn't read 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. So everything has been summed up in this passage. On these two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. The second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. The quotation in verses 37, speaking of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, is from the Jewish word Shema, which all Jews repeated twice daily. That's that renewing of the mind. It's just getting it ingrained into our DNA, into our spirit, into our mind, into our body. And that brings healing. And this perhaps maybe presents the essence of the Judaism and repeating it twice a day, how does, that, how does that filter into the lives? How does that release into the lives of others around them? It's basically speaking about the knowledge of God precedes oneself or, the, or anybody else. We've got to know our Father, our Heavenly Father. Shema not only defines the person of God in terms of his unity, but it also defines the nature of the relationship that God's people are to have with him and one another. So this is where we're speaking about the flesh and the spirit, and we, we, we're looking at the principles and the dynamics. We're looking at the Old Testament laws versus the New Testament law, accounting for the cross that he bridged the divide from the Old Testament right through to the New. It's centered on what he did on the cross over 2,000 years ago for you and me. The price that he paid, bringing the Old Testament and the New Testament combined together, crossing from one to the other, from one state of being to another state of being, coming through repentance and baptism and having your eternal inheritance offered to you. Will you receive? Will you receive? Will you receive? This is the essence of the message. Trust, faith, hope, love, receive. There's a growth in love, kingdom dynamic. 
one of the greatest indicators that we are growing in our relationship with God is found in our willingness to love. God is love. Love is not just something that He does. It is what He is. It follows then that we are never more godly, never more like God than we, than when we love. How easily we may look at these two commandments and say quickly, I love the Lord yet struggle with loving our neighbor. And Jesus makes the second commandment as important as the first. We cannot fulfill the first commandment to love God without obeying the second commandment to love our neighbor. Nor can we avoid this problem by narrowing the definition of our neighbor to people in our neighborhood. That is, those of our family, our race, our perspective, our economic or intellectual level, or perhaps maybe our value system, or even our religion. Big difference between relationship and religion. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, in Luke chapter 10, verses 29 to 37, Jesus makes the world my neighbor by qualifying anybody that God puts in our path who needs me as my neighbor. Two-edged sword. God's working in and through us in a powerful way. And He's advancing His kingdom, not by might, not by power, but by His Holy Spirit. And that's where we need to come into a higher truth, a higher relationship that allows us to be able to share the love of Christ if we're allowed to do that. If we're not allowed to do that, we hold them in prayer and hold them in thought and just ask for the, the Holy Spirit's guidance into that restoration process because we don't want to give the devil a foothold in relationships and broken uh, opportunities for love to be expressed through the love of Christ that he has so freely on the cross, died for us and is expressed for us. Jesus was up in heaven. He came down to earth so he could walk with us and just show us and model us the way. He could have stayed in heaven, but he came down to earth, even went down into the pit of hell to go and get the keys of, of Sheol, of Hades, which we're going to go into a little bit later. So if he's able to come down to earth and just reveal heaven to, to earth, we can reflect back on his model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, yours will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from that evil one. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. Life in heaven will not be an extension of this present temporal existence. We are not here forever. We are just here for a time and a season as with just my mom just uh, said four, four months ago going home to be with the Lord. What a beautiful experience to take her home, to do that he takes her home and we just get to um, be with her and that process from the first breath of life right through to the last breath of, 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 of passing of a loved one. Knowing that we can celebrate. We don't mourn with as those who don't have hope. We mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep when someone goes home to be with the Lord. But we know that there's an eternal inheritance that's been secured, that's been stepped into. Does that give us the opportunity to step into our inter eternal inheritance here while on earth? Yes, of course it does. Does it allow us to do good things for His name's sake and to advance His kingdom? Of course it does. Where does it come from? A place of love. The power of God will provide for a new and greater relationship that transcends the physical relationships in the present order. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today. We love you. We adore you. We give you all the praise and glory for what your word says and how it's transforming not only our minds but our hearts. Not the intellect but the, the experiential. Lord, help us go deeper into your love and help us navigate these seasons. Navigate the times that allows us to be able to let your name be known and let your name be glorified so that more can come into your kingdom. Because this is eternity. This is an inheritance. So Lord, as we ask for your Holy Spirit, we thank you for your life that you shed on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For one is your teacher, Christ, as you are all brethren.